Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking to Jade Barnes. Now she is one of the directors of Ready Set Dance, which is a global dance company that provides preschool dance and babies dance to the world. And I mean to the world because they're in Australia, they're in New Zealand, they've just launched in the US. They have over 250 studios that license their program. They're also on TV, Nickelodeon Junior and other stations as well that have aired their show in over 125 countries. So this is a wonderful dance business success story. And we're going to go through that journey with Jade. Uh, she talks about, you know, starting as a five-year-old little dancer to becoming an artist herself, to then a choreographer, and then a studio owner of 17 years. Uh, she goes on to sell that business and then focuses on the brand Ready, Set, Dance. Uh, it's an amazing story. You know, this is an award-winning businesswoman, and I'm excited to share that with you. And I think it's great that we're actually talking about the business of arts here. This is, this is a great podcast for that, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. I certainly did. Let's kick it off with Jade Barnes. Hey there, I'm Josephine Lancuba, and you're listening to Business Arts and All That Jazz. I've been immersed in the creative business world and performing arts industry for over 20 years. I know from experience that being an artist, a creative or running a creative business can be a tough gig, but I'm here to tell you it's possible. I went from having zero dollars to my name and living below the poverty line to then living paycheck to paycheck to finally living a life of comfort, happiness, passion and even stability. In this podcast, I peel back the curtain and share with you the ups and downs of my journey. Plus, I tap into the minds of creative industry experts to discover their paths to success. I know you have a spark inside of you, that little voice that tells you to reach for the stars. I want to help you step into your limelight to have the courage to live a life you dream of, a life that you design. So get ready to be entertained and inspired as we talk business, arts, and all that jazz. Hello and welcome the gorgeous Jade Barnes from Ready, Set, Dance. I am so excited to have you here on the show. How are you doing today? I'm very happy. We're out of lockdown and the sun is shining and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I know. That was a long stint, wasn't it? It mm -hmm. really was. <laughs> I think it was, what, nearly four months we were in lockdown here in Sydney, right? That's right. Crazy, crazy. And yeah, it's been, you were just mentioning, actually, we were chatting before I hit record and you were mentioning how busy it is to be back. Tell us about that. Like what's going on? Yeah, I think it was a bit of a shock to the system for business owners and mums and everyone just to get back into the normal routine. And I think I'm questioning how I used to do some of that. And I've got to get my mojo back, I think. It's going to take yeah. a few weeks. Yeah, it was definitely overwhelming. I mean, I felt it too because I'm so used to that busyness of running like multiple locations. I mean, you've got a million more, but even me with six, I'm like, that's, you know, it's busy. And then, yeah, I kind of got used to the virtual space you know, but I am happy to be back in person. Right no, now. It's, it's great to be back. It is good yeah, to be back. Yeah, totally. And it's so good for the students as well. Um, look, I met you actually as a co-judge on the, in the Osmumpreneur Network. Uh, we were, I think we were put into a Zoom room together and told we're going to be judges in this particular category with those beautiful entrepreneurial women. Um, and as soon, and I and I didn't know who you were until you said your name, and then you said "Ready, Set, Dance," and you probably saw me light up. I'm like, oh, you were like, I want to find out all about the things you guys have been doing. Yeah, it was really cool because, um, I mean, I've been following Ready, Set, Dance for years just as a brand because it it's really an exciting brand you know um so I've been following that myself and then yeah I got put in a room with you and that was really cool obviously dance is a very big part of your life you're obviously very passionate about it and you started as a little person you know tell me why you chose dance or did dance choose you <laughs> Well, I think I chose dance, actually. My parents chose dance. They were trying 
uh, a few things and I'm the most unsporty person that you will find. I still can't catch a ball to this day. And the moment I walked into my dance class, I just knew I was home and I loved it from the first second. I was one of those preschoolers that came in that just loved it straight away. And I would, I would like to give a shout out actually to my first dance teacher, um, Mrs. Hilda Easton. She actually passed away this week. Um, mm. And it's very sad for our industry I'm because she's one of the most respected dance teachers we've had in New South Wales. And she's trained so many beautiful dancers. And I think from the moment she took my hand into that ballet class, she, oh, I'm getting a bit emotional, but that um, she ignited something in me that's still with me today. So I'm very thankful that my parents chose her and that they chose um, dance for me to be something in my life that's very special. Yeah, and it's amazing how you can form such a beautiful connection with someone who, who teaches you. And I think sometimes you know, people don't realise the significance of that relationship between, you know, a dance teacher and a student. And, and, you know, as you've said, it's quite special. Isn't yeah. It? And I think for preschool dance, which is what we're doing, sometimes the dance teacher is the first person that connects with a child outside of their family network. So it is a very special privilege to be someone trusted mm. and build a relationship with a tiny little person and make these memories. So it, we, yeah. we, we talk about that with our training, with our teachers, that it actually is a real privilege to have this, this wonderful job. Yeah, that's amazing. Look, you know, after you, being a performer yourself, so you obviously were, you know, in, in the world of performing arts as an artist, you went on to be a choreographer, then you went on to be a studio owner. Um, tell me about that transition from being the performer to the business owner. Well, that is a big transition, I'll have to say. Um, I went to university and studied law, so not something that people uh, think that many dancers will do. Mm. I, I paid for my law degree by dancing professionally throughout university and teaching dance. So I was a very unusual law student at Sydney University. And I think I was probably more interested in the law review performances than constitutional law lectures, that's for sure. <laughs> but it gave me an amazing grounding. When I came out of law school, I quickly realised I couldn't leave dance behind. I wanted to still do something with dance. And I was kidding myself that I could basically do law in the day and then start my own dance school at night. So that, that was a, a funny little dream that I had for a minute. And the first day that I opened the studio, I had 66 students. I remember that, the, the number 66. Mm. And by the second year, I had 300. So that it became a full-time job very quickly. And I decided that I would leave law behind and follow the passion that has been with me the whole time. So Did it's a hard decision because, you know, yeah. you've done so, you've, you've got yourself to do this degree. You've invested so much time and money in it. My parents were so excited. I was going to be the first lawyer in the family. <laughs> and then, you know, I had to convince my mum that she would not be, she would not be coming to watch me in court like it was in a Steadford. So you can still come to the yeah. Steadford's mum and watch the, this next generation of dancers. So oh well, look, it all panned out for you in the end, luckily, because yeah. it does. It doesn't always does it for dancers. So that was actually, you know, a good path you've taken. Uh, does the law degree ever help you in your business? Like, has that ever come in and been? Helpful? Yeah, not not so much uh, in my in my studio life when I was a dance studio owner. But now in Ready, Set, Dance, we have five directors and each of us kind of manages a different lane and I manage the legal lane. So a lot of that is to do with trademarking that we're doing and um, protecting our intellectual property. So that's one area that I look after for the business now. And just general contracts. When we did our joint venture with Nickelodeon, that was my responsibility. So even though I'm not going to write the contract, I'm able to read it understand it, communicate it to the rest of the team. So, yes, strangely, it's come in handy in the last few years. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, you had a, a studio for, what was it, 13 years called Planet Se Dance? 17 years. 17 um, years, mm. yeah. What um, you eventually left being a studio owner, was that to sort of focus on Ready, Set, Dance or, or what was the, the reason for that? that leaving behind the studio it was a very hard decision I'll have to say that it felt like my baby and it 
had grown to be one of Sydney's most successful studios. And I, I kind of felt like I had achieved everything I wanted to with that business. Um, a real highlight for me, I remember uh, we entered a competition on So You Think You Can Dance and we won Australia's Best Dance Studio. It was more like an award marketing kind of, yeah, um, yeah. you know, thing that we won. And we were doing that. I had so many graduates and students getting in musicals and really we became the go-to uh, dance studio for kids TV. So I was already choreographing a lot of um all, on all different networks as a, a freelance choreographer using kids for TV and I loved it that was a new part of it that I just I was really gravitating towards and then also I'm a mom I have a beautiful daughter named Bronte and she kind of changed everything for me I think um, she's 12 now but when she was a preschooler that's when we got the, the idea to start Ready Set Dance I think when you're living that life you're more in tune with what's happening with that age group and it's just became like a, a decision for me. Do I want to do two things and juggle being a mum or do I want to really go for it and go for this new big dream, put everything mm -hmm. into that basket and, and move on? And luckily for me, I found um, one, of, one, one of my teachers, who Mr. Mitchell. Hi, Mr. Mitchell, if you're listening. <laughs> um, he is <laughs> the most gorgeous dance teacher and now studio owner ever and I knew I'd made the right decision because everyone loves Mr Mitchell so when we we um announced it everyone was really happy that that was you the person sold the that business, I'd passed yes. it on to he's been in I'd say 1000 musicals himself yeah. he's, he's amazing um you sold you know, that business is that correct I sold that business to Mitchell yeah. so um yeah and we're still you know I'm still supporting him now through these new challenges that he has as a studio owner mm. in in the last couple of years and I love still being a part of the legacy of it which he allows me to do we have a lot of a lot of the success of Planet Dance comes from community and traditions and culture of the studio and I'm, I'm an important part of that legacy and we'd love to keep that going because it's really important to all of the members. So it's great I still get to do that bit, but I don't have to do the whole part. So yes. I can focus my energies on, on the new business, Ready, Set, yeah. Dance. Now, you actually um, are a co-owner of Ready, Set, Dance. There's quite a few of you actually involved. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting because you're all, you're all coming from being studio owners, right? And some of them are still studio owners um, which some people might find to be an interesting blend of people because they might see that as competitive space how did you join forces is it there's five of you is that yeah correct? there's five directors yes. it's it's an interesting story and I get asked this a lot actually because in the dance world um, people are competitive yes. so <laughs> The, the directors, uh, we all actually began our relationship attending competitions and dancing against each other. So mm. it's very interesting that we were able to separate that identity and come together for something common. And I will have to say the reason that happened is um, my amazing mentor, Glenda Yee, and she we like to call her the godmother of dance in Australia <laughs> because everyone knows Glenda Yee, yes. everyone respects Glenda Yee. Um, she, she's, just, she's just absolutely amazing with her wisdom. And she decided uh, quite a few years back that there has to be more to this industry than everyone competing against each other. We share a common experience. And just like the Oz Mumpreneur Network, surely we can come together and do some amazing things that we can't do by ourselves. Yeah. So we came together, five of us, and we all owned studios at the time. And we realised the main problem we were facing was that we didn't have a solution for our preschool dance classes. So a lot of studio owners focus on the, on the seniors and the elite streams in their studio but the future of the business is your preschool classes. And mm. if you're seen as one of the main powerhouse studios in the area, you're not necessarily going to attract parents with the preschooler that just wants to come for fun because they're not getting that messaging. So we decided we would build something together. We would pull all of our knowledge from all of our years of teaching, which it took a while because we think very differently in, in different aspects. So we had to kind of take the best from what we all did create a program and that's when we launched Ready, Set, Dance. And we actually just did it in our own studios for the first year. And suddenly the success came very quickly 
And our other friends in the industry were asking us, can we buy it? And we thought, oh, we didn't really think about that. We made it for ourselves actually, but. Oh, really? Well, yeah. Well, we've made it as a solution for ourselves at, at the start. And, you know, I think in business, they say, if you create a business that solves a problem for something, it's going to be really successful. And we actually just solved the problem for ourselves. And then, you know, other people came forward and said, can we buy it? So we had to learn how to make it into a license. We're not a franchise, we're a license. So we had to learn how to do that. And pretty soon it just, you know, more and more studios. We're, we're at 250 locations now. So yeah, that's from amazing. four locations to 250, it, it's been a, a very uh, exciting journey. I'll say that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I wanted to ask you about that model. So I'm. I'm interested in licensing in the sense that I do it in a different format. I mean, I'm in musical theatre and I write my own shows and my own music. So for me, I'm actually going down the path now of licensing those productions that I've created ah. for my students in-house. Yes. Um, for well, you, that's the very, same kind of thing really, isn't it? It's yeah, I mean, licensing is licensing. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you're licensing a program. What made you go down the route of licensing versus franchising? What was... And what's the difference there for those people listening as well? Well, I think a big difference for us is that we weren't selling them a solution for their whole business. So we didn't want to get involved in what they were doing in their ballet classes, what mm. they were doing in their recreational stream, what their studio was called, you know, what colours their studio would be, what their, what they had, what their risk management policy was, any of that. We just wanted to show them one segment of their business and that's why it made sense to licence that program rather than be a franchise and open Ready, Set, Dance as a dance school all over Australia. So yeah. that was kind of the main distinguishing feature. And I think the game changer for us, um, my business partner Belinda and I had a meeting with a very, very clever man named Sean, and he is our song um, our, our songwriting wizard, we like to call him. And we were saying, oh, we might just pull the best music that, you know, we know and that we love to use and we'll make that the program. And he said, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just write your own music from the start? Why wouldn't you make it exactly how you want it, made for dancers with the knowledge that you have instead of settling for that song kind of works for, for dancers? And it was a massive investment and a big risk at the time. But that is the game-changing decision that took us to Nickelodeon. So I think sometimes if someone comes into your life, you take the advice, um, you take a big risk. That was a big yes. risk for us. But then we actually had our own intellectual property, I guess, just like what you're writing as well. The yeah, same. yeah, and that's amazing. And I, mm. and I get now why you decided on licensing versus, versus franchising because I hadn't thought about the the whole picture of a franchise which That's is right. exactly what you said there's so many intricate parts and pieces to building a business from scratch for a new person that's purchasing a franchise. Yes. And that's a lot of work. That's a whole different, and a whole different yeah. model, I would say. And yeah. you know, we're interested in this one portion of their business. We don't want to look after their whole business. But it's mm. been very successful and we've had studios really been saved by the program studios have new life by the program and that's really rewarding because we just our, our real goal is to we're passionate about helping studio owners so to do that is is really rewarding yeah amazing um now you mentioned that you've got programs in over 250 studios across Australia and New Zealand that's right yeah so that must be busy tell us about that experience yeah so I think at first we, you know, maybe we got to 20 schools and we knew everybody and we knew all the studio owners personally and, you know, it, it was we were running it by our own systems mm -hmm. and then pretty soon we realised we're going to have to, we're going to have to level up here. We're going to have to start running this more like a business. We're going to have to invest in programs, CRMs. We'd never done any of that before. We're going to have to start um, using systems like gap maps to make sales territories for studios. And this was really, I think, like it was, a, it was a fast learning curve to get to that scale so quickly. And then working out the account management of all of that and bringing everyone together. But we did have a, before COVID, we had a conference and we had like 300 dance studio owners in one room. And I don't know if that's ever been done before in Australia. And the energy was electric. And the, the real difference was they were there to talk about business not about dance. 
And that made us really proud because we love the Osmopreneur Network and we've learned so much from them. And I think we wanted to take a snapshot of that into an industry that's very creative. And really, a lot of dance studio owners don't even see themselves as business owners. They see themselves as dance teachers. So to have that forum and to get so so many people excited about the business of dance, that, that was just something that it's really a highlight for us and we hope we get to do it again maybe next year. Yeah I've actually asked that question to some of the creatives I've had here on the podcast and that is do you see yourself as a business and most of them say no and that's because yeah um, even some people that might really surprise you like really big businesses um, or even like published authors or people that have got like best-selling novels don't see themselves as businesses. I always find that really an interesting concept. And I think it's that artist first sort of philosophy and the passion that drives you into your industry. So, but there comes a point though, where if you, you know, passion only gets you so far, right? That's so, so true. And for us, we are always resisting the pull to the shiny new thing especially Mm. me I've got that personality where there's (laughs) something fun and something creative and I really want to do it and then we have to have a little check and say is this actually what our customers want is this actually going to serve a purpose or is it just fun I mean sometimes you can do things just because they're fun that that's Mm. fine as well to fill your own cup but really when you're talking about a business and you're employing a team and you've got responsibilities, you have to look at whether your creative project actually has a purpose. So that's something we've, we've learned to do in the last few years in particular. Yeah. Especially when you have family obligations and all that, like I know I used to run around, you know, I wanted to be a rock star when I was younger and I got to do some really cool stuff, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, to do that now would be, just insane to me like I'd love to see those videos though yeah (laughs) that would be a good podcast our former life amazing (laughs) fast back to rock star um yeah and look you know it was great at the time and I and I don't regret a minute of it because I think having that experience meant that I do live a life with no regrets but um yeah it's so not sustainable long term especially when you have a family you know there is a, a sense of obligation financially, time-wise, you know, if you're going to be putting in all the, the the blood, sweat and tears into having a studio, for example, which we all know can be time-consuming, then there's got to be a financial reward. Otherwise, it's just too much. So it's great to have these, you know, licensed products that you guys are bringing in because it really can amplify people's revenue and bring up their studio. That's right, and connect well. them to the business of dance. Now, you mentioned as well um, Osmumpreneur Network. I'm going to flip back to that because you guys, um, you ladies, won, was it the 2020 Osmumpreneur It was the, the 2020. Year? We won the Osmumpreneur, the big title, which we were just crazy when we won that. And that was on yes. Zoom too. We won that on Zoom. Yes. So we had our own celebration. It was a big full circle moment because the first time we went to the Osmumpreneur uh, Awards, to be honest, we, we had no idea what we were doing. I think we we were gobsmacked and we were and a big part of that, which I will reveal, is a lack of um, laser focus on our numbers. That's what I would say. That's what we learned when we went the first time, that we mm. were more focused on, you know, look how great our brand looks. Yeah. It's so amazing. It's brand new. Listen to our music. Preschoolers love it. We're getting a show on Nickelodeon. Mm. But none of that really was connecting us to some of those really important parts of running a business. And when we went to the Osmumpreneur First Awards, I, I think we thought we were going to be great because, you know, we've won all of our dance competitions. So <laughs> I think we were like, well, you know, we're, this will be great. And then we got there. And when we heard some of those women speak, we, we couldn't stop talking about it in the office for weeks and weeks and weeks. So, and we made that our goal then, right, we know what we have to do. We are going, we are going to get that top prize, but it's going to take us a couple of years to get there. Yeah. And, you know, I loved watching your acceptance speech with you, um, with the five ladies on, oh, right. on camera, because 
I remember, I mean, that year I, I won the Creative Arts Award and I was, and so I was really engaged in the process and I was watching all of the speeches and whatnot. And I tuned in and I saw you guys win the Osmopreneur of the Year. And I was like, oh, yes, a creative business has won the title. That's so exciting. Like, that's really good for creatives to know that that's possible. And you were so bright and colourful. You had this <laughs> big... I think you had balloons and you had had big banner behind you and you guys were like a confetti party on Zoom. It was actually really hilarious, but it was in all the best ways. (laughs) Well, I'll let let you in on a funny story. On the first awards when we did our pitch, we went in our Ready, Set, Dance, bright coloured uniforms, baseball shirts, tights, bows in our hair. Like looking back at that now, we cannot believe we did that. We we are very, we've definitely uh, suited up since then. (laughs) Since yeah. But I guess that was the raw energy of us and people still see it no matter what we're wearing. Um, but it's something that Nickelodeon said a lot. They actually said um, uh, two words that described us was passion and precision. They always were overwhelmed by how much passion we had for everything, but then we wanted to do everything perfect. We're so precise on things mm-hmm. as well. So, uh, yeah, everyone still sees that passion flowing out of us no matter no matter how different our business is now, but still, yeah. still the passion is the base. You say, um, you know, Ready, Set, Dance has aired on Nick Jr. Um, in over 125 countries, which is phenomenal. Um, and you also, you know, talk about going down that TV route. I wanted to understand more about that. So maybe expanding on why you've gone down that television route. Was it just your experience choreographing on TV that sort of led you there naturally or was there a strategy behind that, you know, reach or was it an extra revenue stream or merchandise potential? Like what was the goal for that television avenue? Well, I I think your intro to it was really good because it's a lot of those things that we talked about. The connection came from my past experience. I was working on a TV show called Play Along With Sam and I, I, was, I was the resident choreographer on that show. So I knew a lot of people at Nickelodeon and talk about a fun place to work. You know, they had a giant, when I first started working there, uh, they had a giant slide that used to slide down from the second floor to the first floor. And that was, you know, the fun just popped when you, when you walked in their building. And so I, I had contacts there, but that wasn't necessarily what led, led us to the TV path. I think uh, it's something that we, we dreamed of and we wanted to build that fandom separate from the dance school community. So mm. we, we wanted to make the TV show a business card, basically, for our, for our programs so that people would see it on TV, children would connect to it, and maybe people that weren't necessarily in the dance network would say, oh, I might try that activity. So it, it became a really great business card for, for the programs and for all of our studios as well, and also connecting and um, doing a joint venture with Nickelodeon, that taught us so much. What they did for our brand, the colour and the excitement that you see now and the mascots and, you know, the energy, a lot of that came from the style guide and the toolkit that mm. the Nickelodeon professionals gave us. And that that was really an incredible opportunity to learn from people that do that for a living, that are just such experts in, pre- in preschoolers. So that was you know, such an opportunity. But yes, and when you say the merchandise from a business point of view, that is, we never thought that merchandise would be such a big part of our business, but it is probably about half of our wow. business now. Yeah, so programs would be half and then and then the, the merchandise. And Priscilla, who looks after that in our office, it's become her whole role. It's, it's she's, you know, it's a really huge responsibility for our business. And she, we, we went to China ourselves, we... We went and to all the fairs. We learned a lot about products. We had some big mishaps with products. Mm-hmm. We've learned about sampling. We're learning still about testing for other countries now. It's it's always an opportunity to learn. But it yeah, it's when we talk about the business part of it, it's become a really major aspect. Can you tell us about one of your mishaps with the merch? I find oh, that interesting. Oh, good. I, I one. can't. Pluck a story. All right. Well, there's one that stands out that's, you know, we had um, the main part of our merchandise is our gorgeous tutu uniforms. And mm. being from a dance background, we're very specific on the type of material and the fit of a uniform. And we got a great shipment of it. We felt really confident. 
we ordered 20,000 mm -hmm. and they came in not like the sample at all. So the fit wasn't as good. The frills were rolling up. Um, oh, no. And we actually felt that was it, it was very taxing going back and forward with the manufacturers. It, it took a big toll on our business. We really had to be honest with our customers. We sold them off quite cheaply. Um, we still see those uniforms now coming up in pictures and that haunts us. Uh, <laughs> but what we learned from that after that is when uh, Belinda, Priscilla and Des from my office, they got on a plane and said, we are going to meet the manufacturers ourselves. We are going to China ourselves. We're not going to rely on anyone else anymore. We are going to go and meet them direct and we're going to see the quality for ourselves and establish our own relationships. And that and that's what we've done. And that's been that's made all the difference. We don't have to worry about, you know, that quality assurance anymore. So yeah, and that's but, crazy to get a 20,000 shipment and then it not <laughs> be like the sample. And it's something that other people may not notice as much as you guys would, for example, but it was kind of noticeable. I it was say. noticeable. <laughs> Okay. So it's Maybe, like, I think we were okay. definitely more pedantic, but it, it was noticeable and it just wasn't our usual standard. So, you know, you live and you learn from that. Sometimes you have to yeah. ride that off and, and move on, but just don't do the same thing again. Yeah. I, I would like to ask actually in relation um, with the television show and, and Nickelodeon, because we've talked quite a bit about that, you know, getting a TV spot is a challenge. So you have to pitch to the network and do all these things was it your connections within the network that made it easier or did you still have to go through a process and what was that like? Okay, so I think my connections got the brief on the table. So that's that's a block for a lot of people, I think, yeah. to even be able to get it on the right table. Um, and um, the lovely Jackie decided she, in her wisdom, saw something in what I was talking to her about and she put it on, on the right table. And that made a big difference. But to be honest, when we went and pitched and this was, you know, we made our own treatment, we worked on our own pitch. This was not something we had been trained in. This was not something that we know. The thing that stood out to them the most was that we already had 80 studios doing our program. So yes. we came with a fan base. We came with an established business, with a reputation. And that was what was interesting to Nickelodeon at that time because they were getting pitched by lots of other people mm. that were kind of just believe in me, my idea is really good, but we could mm. already show thousands of preschoolers already believed in what we were doing and the success of that. Um, they already were seeing a little bit of the fandom. We were talking about at our concerts how we, we create little crowd packs, little merchandise that, that parents can buy at the concert. And that kind of, I think, flicked something in their mind too to say oh there's more fandom of this beyond the dancing there's there's opportunities for the merchandise and for the for the brand fans so mm -hmm. I think it was a combination of those things but it was a year of negotiation to get from that first walk-in to being signed so and that that's a big investment legally as well and I, I don't know if I didn't if we didn't have the five of us I'm not sure we would have gone for it so being yeah. in the power of five, as we like to say, kind of gives you the confidence to go forward and do something you might not risk by yourself. And I think that was a big part of it, having the confidence of the five together, getting it on the right table and going with an established brand, not going as a new business. Yeah, girl power, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> do you ever um, compare yourself to the Spice Girls? You know what? No one has ever said that to us before, but I'm going to run with it. I might get a post in the office now that you've said that. Um, so if no. you were a Spice Girl, which one would you be? Oh, hmm. this is what a question that you've just pulled out. <laughs> I have to say Scary Spice, even though I'm very blonde, because she's just fierce. She goes for it. Um, between the different directors, I'm more of a business style, jump in and go for it. Yeah. I like to say that, you know, that one enemy, uh, perfection is the enemy of done. That's a big one for me. I don't like <laughs> to skew over the same. I like to get an idea and Glenda is the same. We'd like to jump in. So I yeah. think that's scary spice, right? <laughs> okay, amazing. Who inspires you? Okay, well... I'd say that's a big mix. In, in our industry, uh, we've just connected with an amazing studio owner in um, America 
Um, her name's Misty Lown, and she runs a dance studio at Erna University over there. And we've been, um, she's become one of our important partnerships for the US. And I'm very inspired by her. She's bringing a whole different kind of way of, of um, running a dance studio owner business and bringing that real community aspect. But some of the things she said lately, I have really resonated with. So I'll have to definitely say Misty Lown. Mm. Um, I'm a person that loves watching um, uh, that loves watching anything on Netflix or any podcasts of women doing amazing new things. So I actually wore, I don't know if you can see, I've got my, um, can you see who that is on yeah. my T-shirt? Yeah. The Notorious RBG. So I've been watching her. I love, <laughs> I love Ruth. Uh, I think, I think maybe that's my law background as well. I think she's her story. Amazing. I love reading all about that. Um, somebody that I worked with in my former life, uh, Denise Duffield Thomas. So she, oh yes, I I follow you know, her and um, listen to her podcast and all that. Yeah, okay. Denise, yeah. So we actually worked at the Olympics together, and I was the host, and she was in the Olympic mascot suit. So all these years <laughs> later, um, <laughs> we're still friends, and she has written some best-selling books that are pretty extraordinary, especially when yeah. you know someone from a former life. So she's very inspiring, and I think I would probably. Um, I'd like to add in Margot Ward. She runs an organization called Kids Express. It's yes. an organization. Do you, have you heard of this organization? Yes. And she does um, healing for healing through performing arts for kids that have been in trauma. And we've had a, a long-standing relationship for a long time. And she came to our conference and spoke. Uh, and something that really stuck with me was about life, uh, work-life balance. And I think we all struggle with that, right? Like that's as a mum, that's the hardest bit. And she said she doesn't like to see it as a scale. She likes to see it as a pendulum mm. and that sometimes you're totally on the, on the work side and sometimes you're totally on the family side and it doesn't really matter as long as it just goes both ways and it can get stuck on one side for a bit. And, and that made sense to me because I think, especially in the creative business, say we're on the TV set for three weeks, we are just all in it from morning to night and everything else goes out the window. And thank goodness we've got grandparents, my amazing mum and dad, you know, picking up all of, of the other part of our lives for that bit. And then you might have some time off and, you know, because you are your own boss, you can have some time off after that and yeah. you can really jump into the school things and you can make sure you're at the school presentation day and you don't miss any of those things because you run your own business. So I think it's okay if you're not always totally in balance as long as you spend a bit of time on each side of the pendulum. Yeah, absolutely. I call it the work-life blend, absolutely. Oh, the blend, yeah, Tell that's Tell me, um, what's coming up now? I know that you guys are about to launch in the States. Um, you've got, obviously, you've got all of your um, licensed studios around Australia and New Zealand, but you are moving into the States and you've got some programs coming up. So what's what's next for Jade and Ready, Set, Dance? Okay, well, two big things. So we actually have already launched in America. So that's Yay. happened. When did it, that happen? It happened in August. So, oh, we, so recently. Very recently. And we built an app. So <gasps> as uh, we've been told now by our, some of our advisors that Nat and Bell are, are basically working on this side of the business. And we've been told we're a tech company now, which is kind of scary to us because we <laughs> don't really have that background. But to make our own Ready, Set, Dance app for the studios over there, we, we spent a lot of time working on that, got that ready, launched it, and we already have studios over there running the program, which is really exciting. I would say it's a little different to how we expected because of COVID. We thought we would be able to get over there and, you know, meet the people ourselves and bring our energy to the conferences. But we launched in a big expo in Vegas. So the Dance Teacher Web in Vegas, and we had some great ambassadors on the floor there and they got some interest for us so yeah we've launched it's happening so that's going to be that's going to be just building now that's the next part of that and the thing that I'm kind of personally working on at Ready Set Dance is a brand new program called Ready Set Move with me and mm. it's for toddlers so just walking age before they normally come to our Ready Set Dance class it's more of a movement and music class that you do with your grown-up so We've found in dance world, the mummy and me kind of class is what yeah. it's normally termed as, but we want to do a more inclusive class. We've always wanted to get more boys into our programs, but now we want to make the grown-up aspect more inclusive, not just mummy as well. So 
dad or grandparents or aunties or anyone can come with their toddler. And I've been working on the music for that. So that is launching in January. And we have over 100 schools launching with that straight up as well on that program. Wow, congratulations. That's that's, amazing. That's creatively probably the most satisfying thing that I'm doing at the moment. So, and and we've been hearing great timing because this age group are the lockdown babies. So they haven't actually left their parents. They haven't gone... Ready, Set, Dance is an independent learning model, so they normally come in the class without their parents, but there's going to be a little bit more hesitancy with that from parents and kids because this 18-month-old age group have been in lockdown most of their lives. So Wow, that's so true. I didn't even think about that. That's crazy, isn't it, to think It's about. very, it's, you know, you think about how much time they normally spend at the shops or at their grandparents yeah. or all those things, and they haven't experienced that. So we're expecting higher levels of anxiety at the start of next year when all the the newbies come into our classes and we're hoping this is going to be a great solution for our studio owners and for parents to experience this with their child, take the first steps of dance together. So what age group is um, Ready, Set, Move with me? Is that 18 months to three years? So that kind of okay. crossover in there as well. Yeah, so. amazing. That's, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Such a great idea and such good timing as well. Um, now, Tell me, how can people find out more about you before we wrap up? So if they want to find you guys or, or look you guys up online, where's the best place for them to go? Well, Ready, Set, Dance socials, uh, you know, we're on Facebook, we're at Instagram, Ready, Set, Dance official. Our YouTube is there too. So you can check out some of our Nickelodeon TV episodes on YouTube. That's probably a great place to, to take a look as well. We're on 10 Shake and we're also on Paramount+. Plus as well at the moment yeah. so quite a few places that you can find us uh, as a team as the as the group of five and um and it's it's a pretty cute page to join really at our socials because the preschool is just they make it magic every day <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you so much for today i really appreciate you coming on the show and it's been great to see how far you can really take such a simple idea as you know preschool dance and really expand it and make it a global brand so well done to you and the team and yeah thank you again for your time today loved it thank you all right bye take care bye if you enjoyed listening and would like to hear more be sure to click subscribe if you're really feeling the love share us with your friends to work with me or to simply find out more about the magic of creativity, arts and business, head to my website, josephinelancuba.com and you can find me on socials. I also have a book that I've co-written with a bunch of amazing entrepreneurial women called The Women Changing the World and you can grab a copy of that at josephinelancuba.com forward slash books. Thanks for listening.